Um, because this is what Stockholm looked like two days ago at the approximate same <coughs> time of day. So, and, and since I'm going to a lot afterwards, I'm slowly making my way to a, a warmer climate. Um, so, um, as Ariel explained, what we do in, in our lab is study neural networks. And I think, uh, especially uh, with prominent members of this audience, uh, uh, I don't need to explain why that is important. but. The strategy we take is to uh, study neurons in, in a context, and the idea is that, that it, only when neurons are connected do they do what they are uh, meant to do because they are in the communication business. And that's why we like to work with preparations where connectivity is intact and they produce as much of that complex activity that you can see in the living brain as possible. Uh, this is one example from uh, thalamic sleep spindles, for example, from my work with Dave uh, McCormick. And, uh, these are actually not neurons at all. This is to follow up on the, on the snow theme here. These are formations in the ice that I saw on the way to work um, that looked a lot like a neurons in DIC to me, so I like them. Um, and we, we know that the patterns that come out of neural networks, of course, especially in the form of oscillations, underlie a lot of what the brain does um, in, in both sensory, motor, and cognitive processing. It has, however, not been particularly well studied in one of the areas that we're interested in, the hypothalamus. Um, so that's what I like to talk about today. Now, there's a reason why these uh, phenomena have not been studied in the hypothalamus, uh, which, which I'll get back to after this slide, I'm reminded to say, um, <coughs> because I always feel the need to justify why we study um, this region. And it is that despite its diminutive size, it actually is involved in pretty much anything that we think of behavioral output of the brain and the behavior of any animal, including man. This is what Harvey Cushing said about the hypothalamus, referring to its small sides here. In this well-concealed spot, almost to be covered with a thumbnail, lies the very mainspring of primitive existence, vegetative, emotional, reproductive, and this is what the part I love, on which with more or less success, man has come to superimpose a cortex and inhibition. So the cortex that manages to control a lot of, of the very primitive urges that want to spring out of the hypothalamus doesn't always do a particularly good job in doing that, of course. Um, <coughs> and, we, and we know that because if you have damage to the hypothalamus, even very tiny damages, you will convert very dramatic phenotypes. This is one classic example um, from, from the 1940s, from Hetherington and Ransom, where they uh, damaged a small part of the mediobasal uh, hypothalamus called the arcuate nucleus, which I'll return to soon. And this is the animal you end up with. It's a, it's a rat that eats voraciously, and this is not 100 grams, this is uh, 2,100 grams, something like that. There's a human correlate to this as well, just to show that these systems are also very active in humans. <coughs> uh, this boy here has a uh, mutation in the leptin receptor, and that's a receptor that is pretty much expressed in the brain only in this arcuate nucleus. So this is really the uh, genetic version of the uh, electrolytic lesion here. And you can see that at, uh, at 
at three years of age, he weighs 38 kilos. Um, the wonderful thing is, of course, that children that don't have the hormone leptin, which uh, I, I should say is a homeostatic hormone uh, from the adipose tissue that decreases food intake. So if you have a lot of adipose tissue, that will uh, decrease uh, your eating behavior. And, and those mechanisms are, are disrupted, of course, in this patient. But you can replace leptin, and then you end up with the very same uh, patient four years later who now weighs actually less than he would at uh, that age. So this is what happens when you damage the hypothalamus. But the hypothalamus isn't studied particularly much as a neural system. It's been studied in much in terms of transcription and, and the very slow mechanisms. <clears throat> this has to do partly with the fact that I think people gave up for a long time on understanding it as a neural system. This is Francis Crick talking about the brain in general. The brain consists of layers and clumps. We can understand layers, and that will, for example, be the cortex and anything that is relatively modularly organized. But we will never understand the clumps, which is the charming term he used for much of the diencephalon. <coughs> This is the reason why. Um, the cortex is, of course, as many of you know, since you work on it, a very orderly organ. It, it has the modular organization of, of the columns, and it's also located in an area of the brain where you can easily get uh, in vivo, uh, put electrodes there. Uh, you contrast that to what we're working on. It's an extremely heterogeneous neuron uh, region where two neurons lying next to each other ha can have completely different sets of transmitters, different inputs and outputs, and certainly very, very different functional relevance. Um, of course, uh, GFP technology and many other transgenic techniques are now actually making the hypothalamus a lot more accessible. And I should say, of course, it's also in, in one of the nastier regions to put an in vivo electrode in. <clears throat> but we think uh, it can eminently be understood, and you need to understand it in terms of neural properties in order to know what the hypothalamus does to, to keep you alive, because that's what it really does. The system we focus on is a neuroendocrine system. <coughs> now, just as a general introduction to these systems, um, this is the hypothalamus here connected to the pituitary, which is the uh, contro main controlling endocrine organ of the body, of course. Um, you have in the hypothalamus several populations of so-called parvocellular neuroendocrine neurons, which uh, project to the median eminence and the vascular bed here, release factors into here, and they're usually peptide hormones, that then travel by way of the circulation down to the anterior pituitary, uh, where they are, uh, are released from the vasculature to act on, on um, endocrine cells that then cause the release of pituitary hormones uh, that in turn are involved in, in most of the body functions one can, one can think of. We're interested in a specific one of these, and that's a system that controls the release of the hormone prolactin from the anterior pituitary. This is a polypeptide pituitary hormone, first discovered by, uh, or discovered, I should say, by Oscar Riddle at a time when you can get your face on the cover of time if you discovered a hormone. I don't know if that's still possible. Um, it is an intriguing hormone because it does a number of things that uh, belong to a program. The program is there to... Uh, as we imagine it today, prepare the mother to take care of a baby. Um, and its, uh, it's, it's uh, levels in the blood spike uh, in late pregnancy and, and early after parturition. Um, it, sorry about that. It stimulates lactation. That's what it was named for. But it also inhibits fertility and decreases sexual libido. Both of these are thought to space out pregnancy, so you will focus on the baby at hand. It stimulates maternal behavior, possibly also paternal behavior and it promotes body weight gain, and the idea is that you will then uh, accumulate energy to take care of the baby. So it's very powerful. Um, it also has a, a rather intriguing regulation. Now, while most of the hormones from the anterior pituitary are controlled by, primarily by uh, stimulatory factors from the hypothalamus, prolactin is actually uh, controlled primarily by inhibition. Uh, so there is a tonic inhibition being provided uh, by hypothalamic neurons, and we know that because if you would cut here, which can happen traumatically or you can do it experimentally, all the other pituitary hormones will spike in the blood, uh, will drop in the blood, sorry, but prolactin will spike because you relieve this inhibition. So what is this inhibition? Well, it was um, demonstrated many years ago that these are, uh, and what also makes this unique, that these are not peptide hormones, these are actually dopaminergic neurons. Uh, that provide this inhibition. We call these tuberinfundibular dopamine neurons, or TIDA neurons, first discovered by, by Shell Fuxet at my department um, in 1962, 63. Um, 
Again, uh, this is exemplified by clinical situations. Patients that are treated with antipsychotics or uh, to the degree that those have antidopaminergic activity will, as a rule, have hyperprolactinemia. And this is probably the cause of a lot of their sexual uh, side effects. So it's clinically very um, powerful, the system. But it wasn't known uh, until a few years ago what the actual electrical properties are. So the question that we have tried to answer in our studies and are continuing to try to answer over the network and cellular properties that underlie this inhibition of prolactin secretion. This is work by my postdoctoral fellow, David Lyons. Pretty much all of the work I'm going to show you was done by David's skilled hands. Um, so Dave was recording in the arcuate nucleus. This is a schematic of the arcuate nucleus here in a coronal section. Uh, you can see that the neurons lie alongside the third ventricle. And ever so often, he would come across a population that had an intriguing oscillatory behavior. And I want to point out this is spontaneous oscillation. We are not giving any electrical or pharmacological stimulation. This is what the neurons do in the slices we're recording. Um, these are all from male rats. Um, this may be true in f females too, but, but so far we've only done our studies in males. Um, the oscillation is uh, relatively slow. Uh, it has a, a period of about 20 seconds, um, but it's, it has a very high amplitude of some 30 millivolts. Um, it's exceptionally uh, regular, um, and you can see that the neurons oscillate between what we have called a hyperpolarized down state and a more depolarized up state. This is using cortical terminology, which you can discuss if that is as, as appropriate here, because it's not a true biostability. It's, it's a continuous state of depolarization, of course. But that's the nomenclature we differentiate it with. And you can see that you have a prominent peak here in the membrane potential distribution over the down state, and a smaller peak over the up state. Now, what was, what was uh, a little surprising to us, this was before we knew what the neurons were, uh, was that we were actually setting out to look for another population of neurons that regulated the uh, food intake, but uh, David would only find them here in the dorsal part of the arcuate nucleus. Um, so that's not where, where those feeding regulatory neurons are. Uh, the neurons that are there, however, are the dopamine neurons. So uh, we had to stain to actually find out what they were, of course. These are, are recovered neurons after recording. This is a particularly nice example. I'm so, I see if I can... Well, yeah, I think it'll show anyway. What I need to tell you, however, is that in the middle here you have the third ventricle. So this is one side of the arcuate nucleus. This is the other side of the arcuate nucleus. What Dave was record doing here is that he was recording from one side, and he first came across four neurons, uh, none of which were oscillators, because the oscillators are very rare. They're not a, uh, in, in this very heterogeneous nucleus. They're only a part of the population. Okay? Then he moved the recording electrode over to the other side, and he found uh, the first cell he encountered was an oscillator. Um, and then we stain the, these slices for tyrosine hydroxylase as a marker for uh, uh, their dopaminergic phenotype. And this is what we see then. I don't know if you can see this, but if you look at this cell here, you'll see that it's actually the oscillator is uh, TH positive, uh, whereas in this case, these cells actually are not. Now, we've done this in, in a large number of neurons, and it turns out that all the cells that oscillate in the arcuate nucleus are tyrosine hydroxylase positive, whereas uh, none of the uh, non-oscillators are ever tyrosine hydroxylase positive. So we think this is a very particular property of these neurons. So that's what they are. Now, uh, what is, how does the oscillation occur? And this, we have a lot of work still to do. I'll tell you what we've shown so far. Uh, the first question was, how does it... Uh, um, how does it uh, you know, appear in the first place? So we wanted to know if there was uh, synaptic uh, connectivity between these neurons, and, and uh, you'd think that paired recording is obviously the way to go, and that we still have to do. This kind of was just a, a result we came across, but which may shed some light on that. Now, it turns out when you do, so we switch to voltage clamp now, and this is just to remind you what the up and the down state are, and of course they look flipped in, in voltage clamp. Uh, here we've isolated for uh, in inhibitory input, and here we've isolated for excitatory input. And what you can see is that uh, the inhibitory input actually clusters during the up state as opposed to the down state, whereas the excitatory input shows no such difference. Um, 
this uh, data can actually be understood in light of the fact that these cells are not, they don't just have dopamine, they are GABAergic themselves. So what we think is happening here in the upstate as the cell is firing is that they're firing onto each other and releasing GABA. So there seems to be GABAergic crosstalk between these target neurons. And the relevance of that we have, we have yet to, to, to go into detail. So uh, is synaptic connectivity important for the oscillation? <coughs> it turns out probably is not, because when uh, Dave does an experiment to block uh, uh, synaptic connectivity, or actually he does it in many, many ways, he's done these separate, but in this one he went full Monty and, and killed everything there was. So he uses a cocktail here of blockers of fast GABAergic and glutamatergic transmission. He bathes them in low calcium, high magnesium, and he's also recording them in voltage clamp, the relevance of which became evident to us only later. Uh, the oscillation still persists. So it seems that you don't need uh, conventional chemical uh, synapses in order to have an oscillation. Um, obviously, uh, uh, well, does it, d d is there any other way for these neurons to communicate? Um, well, uh, we did a, a, a simple experiment inspired by the literature. Uh, where we took uh, neurons and then just quite simply hyperpolarized them. What you can see is that you, uh, as you hyperpolarize them, uh, amplitude, of course, goes down the oscillation, as you would expect if there's any contribution on voltage dependent conductances, but nothing happens to frequency. So that suggested to us that the oscillation is possibly being imported from some other neuron uh, that is not uh, experiencing this manipulation. So it starts to raise the question if the oscillation is synchronized. Um, and indeed, it turns out to be not just synchronized, but highly synchronized. This is a pair recording between two different cells. And if you then see them superimposed, so you can see that not only uh, uh, do they start the up and the down state at the same time, every little deviation in membrane potential is nicely recapitulated between both cells. So these cells are synchronized and they're face locked. What is the mechanism? And I don't think this will come as a huge surprise, but <coughs> it turns out that it's gap junctions. So here we're blocking gap junctions uh, by means of uh, pharmacological manipulation, carbonoxalone, 18 beta glycerotinic acid, and both of these manipulations uh, will uh, kill the oscillation. It takes some time to wash in, which is always the case with these drugs, of course. Um, we know from other labs now, we've done paired uh, recordings, that they also find examples of electrotonic coupling. Uh, so this is something also we want to go into further. Now, this is, data is, in a sense, a little surprising to us because you could imagine that if, if you block uh, electrical communication between the cells, you would expect them to maybe desynchronize, but they could still maintain the oscillation. So what we're wondering now if there's a certain uh, volume of the network that's necessary to maintain the oscillation, and also this is in the pipeline. So uh, that's as far as uh, what we have currently on the mechanisms of the oscillation. We're also looking into conductances. There seems to be a contribution of persistent sodium current to drive the oscillation and a contribution of, of uh, BK channels to, to terminate the down state. But what I'd like to talk about now is the regulation of the uh, uh, tidal oscillation. To, and, and that is uh, our attempt to put it in a functional context. So I'll give you three examples of that. And the first one is serotonin. Serotonin is a, sorry, is a very powerful stimulator of prolactin release. Um, that's just summarized on this slide. There are many, many, there's a big literature on this, but this is one of the earlier examples I found. I'm sorry, I'm still learning how this works. Sorry. Um, <coughs> this is from 1973 here. Uh, uh, the authors didn't administer serotonin, but uh, tryptophan, which is precursor, of course, to serotonin. To look at what happens to serum prolactin, you can see this huge spike in prolactin in the blood after you give tryptophan. Now, clinically, this becomes relevant also because uh, hyperprolactinemia is not just common in patients who get anti-schizophrenic uh, anti, uh, drugs, but also in antidepressants, especially, uh, or only in SSRIs, not tricyclic antidepressants. Prozac is is, is one of those drugs that do it, but uh, most SSRIs will actually do that. And then the possibility is, of course, that it is the actual uh, <coughs> serotonin accumulation that causes hyperprolactinemia. So we thought that raised the question of what does serotonin do to these neurons? Because you could imagine, in, in this system, you can imagine at least two levels, of course, of regulation. 
either at the pituitary uh, itself, on the pituitocytes that produce prolactin, and you can imagine transcriptional events, for example, or electrical events, because these are excitable cells. Uh, but what we think now, with the oscillation in hand, that it's very possible that modulation of the discharge state of the uh, neuroendocrine neurons could also contribute to the regulation and be an important factor. So that's what we have looked at here. This is a uh, recording in current clamp, we're back to current clamp again, of the oscillation. And here we're applying serotonin, and what you can see is that you get a very prominent hyperpolarization and abolishment of firing. Um, and this is, is, is highly reproducible. And I'll say that any, pretty much any drug we tried, or exactly every drug we tried, if it affects one titan neuron, it ex, uh, affects all titan neurons, which may uh, be a reflection of, of their electrical connectivity. It may be that not all cells actually need a serotonin receptor. If you have on a few key cells, then you will actually get the effect throughout the network. Um, <coughs> so how does serotonin do this? Uh, it appears to involve a net outward current. So here, uh, they just, uh, again, applying. This is in TTX recording now. So it suggests that it's a direct postsynaptic effect. Uh, application of serotonin gives this very dramatic and quick hyperpolarization um, that persists for quite some time. If you look at, um, at um, uh, input resistance, there is a, a, a small uh, uh, decrease in input resistance. Am I too jet lag now? Am I saying this right? Yes. Right. Okay, sorry. Need to think for a moment. Um, so, what, what happens here? What, what is it mediated by? So, this is in voltage clamp again, uh, applying serotonin, and you see uh, this uh, uh, a net outward current being elicited by serotonin. What is the uh, underlying mechanism of this? Well, if you do run RAMs to find the uh, reversal potential, you can see that, uh, and this is a magnification of the trace here, that it uh, you probably can't read this, but this is a reverse potential of about minus 128 millivolts, which is around where you'd expect a potassium reversal in these neurons. You can also see that it's uh, dramatically diminished when you cesium load the cell, uh, also suggesting a potassium involvement. And, and when you start changing to high potassium, which we do uh, both here, and uh, it, it, so this is a holding potential of minus 60 millivolts, I should say, and in the RAM, you uh, first uh, you abolish uh, the uh, outward current, and you can also see how you shift the reversal potential of the, uh, the, the serotonin-induced uh, current, suggesting that this is indeed uh, potassium-mediated. The uh, receptor involved appears to be uh, sorry, uh, serotonin-1A receptor. Uh, we tried both with the agonist, which gives the same effect as serotonin. In this case, we're blocking with the antagonist. So here you can see uh, the uh, serotonin effect, again, as I showed you before, in voltage clamp. And we'll put in the same cell, when we then pre-apply a 1A antagonist, then that serotonin response is gone. And we tried an, a number of different uh, pharmacological tools here, and it seems to be relatively clean a 1A effect with a small contribution of 2C as well. So this is what we think is happening. Serotonin stimulates G-protein coupled inwardly rectifying uh, channels. That gives you the hyperpolarization that abolishes firing. The abolished firing will then uh, lessen the dopamine release and that will relieve the tonic blockade or prolactin release. So that uh, would be a potential mechanism for serotonin to cause prolactin secretion. Another example, then, of a um, prolactin releasing agent is thyrotropin releasing hormone. So uh, TRH, as it is known in its short form, is, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is a tripeptide hypothalamic hormone. It's the first neuroendocrine releasing factor that was uh, purified and characterized by Guimain and Shally. Um, and what it does in the pituitary system is that it causes... Uh, release of thyroid stimulating hormone, which in turn then stimulates the thyroid to release thyroid hormone. But in addition to this uh, effect as a master hormone on the thyroid axis, it also has very prominent effects on prolactin release. 
Um, and there it plays a role antagonistic to dopamine in that it stimulates prolactin release. Now, this has always been assumed to happen at the pituitary level. So it would be TRH uh, as it is down in the pituitary to take care of the thyroid axis. You might as well do a little uh, extra work on the, on the lactotrophic axis. But there are uh, conditions where patients can have hyper uh, or increased serum levels of TRH and no change in their serum prolactin levels. There's a discrepancy there suggesting that it doesn't have to act on the pituitary. And there's actually very few of the pituitary lactotrophs that have TRH receptor. Now, what we think is that there's a distinct possibility that TRH could actually be doing part of its uh, prolactin-releasing action uh, here, up here in the hypothalamus, by uh, changing the network properties of dopaminergic neurons. Now, this uh, uh, is so far unexplored. So that's what we looked at here. Uh, first, we had to find out if there was any TRH around, first of all, to do this. Now, <coughs> this is staining for TRH in green. These are the tight endurance in red. And this is uh, then uh, both images superimposed. And if you just focus then on these high magnification images, you can see that the red tight neurons are eminently decorated by TRH terminals. So there seems to be the machinery is all in place to give them uh, a large dose of, of TRH. So that was, that was uh, encouraging. What does TRH do? <laughs> well, uh, remember now that serotonin, a, pro a prolactin releasing factor, hyperpolarizes the cells. That's the easiest way to make sense of this. You just take away the action potentials, there's no dopamine release. So that's what we expected for TRH. That turns out not to be the case at all. So instead, <clears throat> what TRH does is it depolarizes uh, tight neurons and sets them into tonic firing. And so it switches from this phasic discharge into tonic firing of action potentials. And it's a nice reversible effect. Um, the mechanism appears to be uh, both post and presynaptic. The postsynaptic part is a uh, out uh, is an inward current um, that we uh, today believe is mediated by a trip uh, current. Uh, there's also an element of increased presynaptic excitation uh, that seems to contribute to this. But overall. Uh, both mechanisms would contribute to this uh, overall excitation. So uh, I just want to uh, insert here that, that this is a very fascinating peptide. We tried in a number of systems. This is my postdoctoral work with Dave McCormick. Uh, this is work we're doing in the cortex, looking at the cortical slow oscillation. And uh, of course, this is what I just showed you in the hypothalamus. In all these cases, TRH is a very powerful depolarizing agent that can switch systems from oscillating to tonic firing. Um, now, the sources of, of the TRH are probably different in all these cases, um, uh, but it, it suggests that there is some, uh, or what we think is that these data might be an explanation for why TRH, in addition to the uh, actions I talked to you about, also is very powerful arousal peptide, and it also has anti-epileptic properties, uh, even in patients, um, and it has been explored for clinical use. Course, this may be a bit of concern in that case. Anyway, how do we make sense of the TRH data since it was opposite to serotonin? It's supposed to do the same thing. Well, <coughs> here's what we think. Uh, this is this would be the old uh, view of this uh, dopaminergic system where there's a competition between dopamine and TRH at the pituitary level. Now, what we are proposing is that to refine this idea, you need to look at prolactin regulation, as I mentioned, much more here in the hypothalamus. And what you have in the hypothalamus are, is a dopaminergic network, not just single cells, and the dopaminergic neurons are connected by way of gap junctions, and together they oscillate uh, in this uh, highly robust fashion. And TRH, as a uh, prolactin releasing agent, can then shift the system to tonic firing. What we are proposing now is that uh, the oscillation might be a condition necessary in order to deliver large amounts of dopamine to the pituitary, whereas tonic firing would uh, actually result in less dopamine. And then uh, that would in turn then give the inverse relationship, of course, in, in, in prolactin. So how, how do you make sense of this? Well, 
Um, <clears throat> this is really uh, going back in the literature and, of course, looking at what people have described in mesencephalic dopamine system and also in magnocellular hypothalamic neurons, that oscillations or phasic firing, rather, is a much more efficient way of releasing transmitter than is uh, our tonic spikes, uh, likely due to uh, large calcium buildup during the plateaus. But what might also contribute to making this uh, a very powerful system is not just release efficiency, but it also has to do with the ability uh, of the cells to keep up with dopamine demand. When you have an oscillation, you can imagine that that leaves a little room for cells to actually make more dopamine, uh, if need be. Uh, now, this may not be as necessary in other dopaminergic systems, in the mesencephalon, for example, because these neurons rely very much on reuptake in order to keep, keep themselves stocked with dopamine. Um, and that's what you interfere with, of course, with cocaine and amphetamine. But these cells <coughs> don't have that uh, mechanism as powerfully at their disposal. They do express dopamine transporter, but I remind you that they are releasing their dopamine not into another cell or in a synaptic cleft, but rather into the bloodstream, and then it's washed away into the pituitary. So you can't really take back the dopamine that you've already sent on its way to the pituitary. So a cell that keeps firing a lot of dopamine may run the risk of eventually running out of it. This is all, of course, highly speculative. We're setting up the experiment right now to test this hypothesis by recording from the cells at the same time as we're uh, recording dopamine release with carbon fiber electrode here, and then we'll be able to see if there actually is such a relationship. But we leave the, also the purpose of this oscillation is likely not timing. Uh, first of all, uh, because this system doesn't need to be fast the way you need to be in the cortex where you're uh, processing sensory input, for example. This works on a much slower time scale, but also as you're releasing things into the bloodstream, you get a, you know, that's, that's really filtering away any oscillation. So we don't think that these cells are seeing an oscillation, but we do think they're seeing varying amounts of dopamine. But as I said, this remains to be, to be explored. The third and last example I want to show you of the modulation of the oscillation is prolactin itself, which uh, uh, acts as in any good uh, neuroendocrine fashion to inhibit prolactin release. So it's a negative feedback loop shown here. <coughs> when you have large amounts of prolactin, it acts, uh, it, it goes back through the blood and can act on uh, these dopamine cells which have a relatively leaky blood-brain barrier so they can see a lot of what goes on in the serum. And then the idea is, of course, that this would be an inhibition that really uh, is a disinhibition in, in that uh, or, uh, or rather, uh, sorry, an amplified inhibition in that you're causing, you're stimulating the dopamine neurons to release more dopamine and that gives you a much stronger blockade of prolactin release. Now, again, this has been studied primarily in transcriptional ways, so we do know that uh, prolactin is very powerfully uh, upregulates tyrosine hydroxylase transcription and phosphorylation of tyrosine hydroxylase, so you get much more dopamine in this case. But what happens to the electrical properties, and that was something we want to explore here. So <coughs> David did uh, another recording, uh, and again, the oscillation, as you know by now, uh, washing in prolactin, I want to mention this turned out to be the first time, despite this being a very powerfully active hormone with very powerful behavioral effects, it had actually not been tested on neurons before. So, so kind of like that this was the first example of prolactin electrophysiology, um, and we weren't sure that this rather large hormone of 200 amino acids would have particularly strong uh, effects on membrane properties, but it gives a relatively quick and, ve and, and very potent depolarization, sending the cell into tonic firing, as you can see. Again, the uh, biphasic uh, distribution of membrane potentially here replaced by a single peak. And this is postsynaptic, reversible, and dose-dependent. So this was problematic, uh, because even though the effect is powerful, tonic firing was exactly what we had seen with TRH. But TRH is supposed to cause release of prolactin. Prolactin is, of course, is supposed to cause inhibition of prolactin release. So we had a discrepancy here that we needed to figure out what was going on. Now, one way of rationalizing this with the idea that that uh, firing pattern actually translates into uh, the amplitude of release would be that it's perfectly okay for prolactin to do the same thing as TRH if it also does something more. And I'll try to explain what we mean by that. <coughs> so uh, in, to do that, we need to figure out what is it that prolactin is regulating in the membrane of uh, tight neurons. So first of all, here is uh, 
Another example of voltage clamp where we're in the holding current, I should say, in, in these accordance is always minus 60 millivolts. And you can see that <coughs> prolactin induces a nice uh, inward current, very much as we had seen with TRH. So indeed, it does seem to do what TRH does. But when we run the ramp, and I apologize, you can't see it here, but when, uh, when you uh, do the subtraction curve to look at the prolactin-induced ductance, it becomes clear that something else is going on as well. In the hyperpolarized range, uh, the cell has what we call a low-voltage activated conductance. And up to this point, this is exactly the same trace that you would be seeing uh, in uh, a TRH recording. But as it approaches zero millivolts and goes into a very depolarized range, instead where uh, a TRH-induced uh, current would take uh, this route, you instead have a very large inward current, which we call a high-voltage activated conductance, which is then uh, unique to prolactin. So what's going on here? Well, we think uh, that this is quite simply the depolarization that we see where the cell, where that is pushing the cell into tonic firing. But when it gets into the state where it's actually firing, then you have this other conductance going. And this is, this is of course, a state where you have action potential regener uh, generation. So we need to see what happens to the actual action potential in those circumstances. Oh, sorry, uh, I just quickly went through these data, but this is just to show the properties of the low voltage activated ductance. You can block it with chip channel blockers uh, to APB that we used. In this case, so that's a red trace. You can see that this component is now gone, whereas nothing happens to the high voltage activated uh, component. So they seem to be uh, mediated by two separate um, <coughs> ion uh, conductors. Um, it's also mediated by a sodium dominated mixed cation current that we show if we, if we now uh, exchange sodium for uh, trist in this case. You can see that uh, this component is much diminished, all suggested uh, of uh, chip channel involvement, exactly as we had seen for TRH. Now, so as I said, when we get into the high voltage range, we have something else happening, and that's where you have action potential. So what happens to the action potential? Uh, well, if you just quite simply superimpose, uh, although this is, these are averages, and you can see the individual, well, you can't see the individual traces, but they're in the figure there. Um, a control, a action potential under control con uh, conditions and one under the influence of prolactin, you actually have a very large um, uh, increase in the width of the, of the action potential. Now this may look small, but if you look at other studies where people have looked at uh, changes of, of, of this magnitude, which uh, is about 16% of area under curve, I think there's a, 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 a one of, of uh, Bernardo Sabatini's early papers with uh, uh, Wade Regeer, uh, they showed that, and, and this was in cerebellum, but they had, had the exact same uh, increase actually in, in width that translated to a 300% increase in calcium in the presynaptic terminal. So these changes have enormous effects in terms of the ability of the neuron to actually release transmitters. And I'm not going to show you the data, but this is an interaction of L-type calcium and BK-type potassium uh, channels. Uh, we believe in as a closure of the BK type. So uh, to summarize these data, what we think is going on here in, in this schematic version of a Titan neuron is that you have prolactin doing two things. First of all, it goes through trip conductance, causes depolarization. This is a TRH-like part, but in addition, uh, in the higher voltage range, you also get through this interaction of L-type and BK type uh, conductances, spike broadening. So this would give you not just a state where the neuron is firing more action potentials, but also one where it's firing, if you will, more efficient action potentials. And we believe that that would increase dopamine release. Now you could argue, and you would be very right to do so, well, who cares if they're trying to release more dopamine if, if the fatigue idea is still correct, then, then the, the tonic firing should still, uh, you know, very quickly they should still run out of dopamine. But this is where the transcriptional mechanisms come in that people uh, have shown before, is that a hyperprolactinemic state is also one where you have a lot more dopamine to release because tyrosine hydroxylase mRNA is increased, tyrosine hydroxylase phosphorylation is increased, which then leads to a much higher production of dopamine. And that in turn then decreases prolactin release, and so you close the loop in this sense. So maybe you don't even need to spike broadening, right? If you also 
just increase the subscription itself was already held. It might not. Well, yeah. Uh, theoretically, that that might not be necessary. No. Um, and again, this is something we hope to be able to look at with uh, what happened to the recordings. So, uh, in summary, what what I've showed you and, and what we believe we have here uh, is a uh, oscillating system and oh, sorry about that. There we go. Is an oscillating system um, that uh, could be necessary in order to give a lot of dopamine release in order to keep prolactin down and. What is nice about this is that it's, there seems to be uh, several uh, possibilities here to uh, manipulate this system. It's not a simple on-off switch, but it rather depends on, on exactly which components of the membrane properties you, you tamper with, and you will have very different outputs. So in the case of serotonin, what happens is a hyperpolarization, uh, which we believe is GERC-mediated, uh, that we then would propose uh, causes uh, dopamine uh, release to decrease and prolactin release to increase. In the case of TRH, instead you have a depolarization, tonic firing, chip channel mediated, uh, which we then believe, however, has, may have the same functional output in terms of a decrease of dopamine and increase of prolactin. In the case of prolactin, and this would be the negative uh, feedback situation, uh, again, as in this case, you have a switch to tonic firing, but you also have this addition of the broadening of the action potential, and that, we believe, gives you more dopamine and less prolactin. So that's where we, we stand today with a lot of questions left to answer, obviously, but it's a very intriguing system, and we think that, that the hypothalamus, this is just you know, one little facet of what the hypothalamus may have to, to offer. Um, <clears throat> and as I mentioned, this work was done primarily by David Lyons in my lab, it's, uh, with the histochemical contributions of Arash Helisas and Emilia Hochales and Virginie Brifot and Stefano Stagorak is also now working on the electrophysiology of this system. We are very grateful that somebody likes to fund this work and we would also like to have more people in the lab. So if there's anybody interested, please go ahead and contact me. Thank you. So we haven't done that, and uh, um, part of the reason is that we're still doing this in rats. So we haven't, we don't have a, we have enough, we have an N of eight pairs, and that's you know enough to, to to do the paired recordings, and that's because we're doing it in rats. We're switching to GFP tagged animals now in order to be able to do more paired recordings. But I know that from another group who have done it. I don't know what the numbers are in terms of coupling coefficient. I can say in in our N of eight, we didn't see. Uh, any examples of that. So it seems to be relatively low, or it seems to be that not a whole lot of cells coupled to each other. Uh, we're looking forward to the calcium imaging experiments because we think that would also give an idea about that. Any idea how gate junction generates oscillation? Um, I mean, the, the, the question we have... The role of gate junction is to equalize everything. Yeah. Instead, it starts to generate. I know. I've, I always find it a little weird, uh, but... Of course, a, a lot of oscillating systems do have a lot of gap junction coupling, but so it, at first I thought that was strange because you would think that it would just flatten everything, but uh, it seems to be instead a property of oscillating systems in a way. What I'm wondering in this case, I mean, uh, you know, one, one could certainly say that these drugs are not the cleanest drugs and maybe they interfere with a lot of conductances. There is that possibility, but I think there's a lot of other arguments to say that they have gap junctions. Um, but the idea is very vague in, in our minds now, but the idea but it may be that you need a certain size of the network in order to, to get an oscillator. But that it's not enough for a single cell to get into this mode. And how that would happen, one, one can debate. And, and I think we, we have the experiment to test it, uh, but from there we'll have to figure out the mechanism. And the other question is, the IFHC activates a current with a relative potential of minus 120? Yes. So I'm no, with a reversal potential. Sorry. The reversal potential of the kind activated by the pipe HD. That, that's a minus 128, yeah. I don't know how you can get 120 millivolts. So 
reversal potential. There is no ion composition that will fit this reversal potential. No, well, you know, we, we don't know if we have a particularly perfect clamp. The closest thing we get is potassium. I mean, I, I wouldn't say that it's... Potassium is 80. Minus 80. 120. Very strange. I've been down to 100. I, I've seen examples of 110. I the potassium equilibrium potential of 110. That's, yeah. That's required. Either well, I, you know, I'll, I'll say this. Outside right. Or extremely low potassium inside. Otherwise, you cannot get that. I, I'll say, it, you know, it's, I, I would agree that it doesn't seem particularly physiologic. It's our, our, you know, it's our best guess. I don't know what else would be beyond that, I would say. But I, 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 my experience is that Somebody it's really one, more high quality. <laughs> <laughs> the last question is, in both cases, you increase the firing of the dopaminergic cell. Yeah. And in one case, you get decrease in release. And in the other one, you get increase in release. This is speculation. You want to claim that it's because of the boiling of the spike. But if you look at the figure on the last one, The TRH caused decrease in release, right? The TRH caused decrease in dopamine release, yes. That's the idea. Release. That's the idea, yes. And the PRL increased. Yes. The amount of calcium going through this TRPC, in, if this is the frequency of firing, is far more than the broadening of the spikes. No, 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 the, 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 no, no this, is not the, this is not given the broadening. This is given the depolarization. The, the BK is giving the, the yes, broadening. Much higher depolarization in TRH. It's obviously sitting on the spike, but it's... Uh, no, this is, this is not more... No, no, the, my, my question yeah. is that you want to claim that the broadening of the spike generates the increase in release. Yes. Well, that, that makes the, the difference the between the... the spike triggering. Y yes. The number of spikes you have there is... Oh, sorry, no, but this, uh, it, it, these are on a different time scale. Ah. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I mean, I, I just made this, yeah, this is, yeah. When, when you look at the actual frequency, they're, about, they're not particularly fast, actually. I mean, this is, this is uh, I want to say, 5 hertz or something. But, but it, it's the same in these conditions, yes. Sorry. This needs a, a scale bar on this one, too. Yeah, but I, you know, in, in that case, you would like to think of a, a physiological situation where that would be, you know, so it's not just um, yeah. slice conjecture. Um, um, yeah. But you, yeah, well, I mean, I mean, from a therapeutic sense, of course, you want to override some of the side effects. You could, you could imagine that you could dabble with that. That's true. Uh, oh, yeah, um, TTX, for example, uh, abolishes the oscillation. Now, at first, we thought that was, that was a proof that there was synaptic coupling, but we think that's the persistent sodium contributing to the oscillation. So anything that tampers with, uh, with persistent sodium current will kill the oscillation, for example. Um, I'm trying to think of what other examples we have. <laughs> well, that's the most powerful one, for example, but there are, there are other, other ways of doing it. Yeah. H current is right? H current is, is strange to us. Um, now, we, we are able to change the properties of the oscillation with um, uh, ZD7288, uh, um, but we never see any example of, of the hyperpolarizing sag, or, or so it, it may be sitting far out on dendrites or somewhere, but, but uh, th th we're still trying to figure out what, what that means. Um, pharmacologically, we, we can, it doesn't block the oscillation, uh, but it, it, it stretches it out. The change of the temporal properties. No, no, the, the frequency. Yes, in terms. Of, yeah, yeah, 